We have a great program lined up. We have the privilege tonight of hearing from 10 remarkable leaders, leaders who are making a difference across our region. We have leaders from the business community and from the nonprofit community, leaders who are entrepreneurs, public officials, and civic activists. And they face quite a challenge. Each of them has five minutes to present a big, bold idea. Each presentation, I'm told, consists of 20 slides, and each slide will move forward every 15 seconds. So I think this should be fun. And I think we'll find the presentations interesting. I think we'll find them intriguing. And I hope we'll find them inspiring. Daniel Webster, the famous senator from Massachusetts, once described our grand Republican experiment as the people's government, made for the people, made by the people, and answerable to the people. I'm proud to serve with the Municipal League. I'm proud of our history of making a difference. I'm proud of what we do. And I'd like to encourage each and every one of you tonight to join us. But if there's one thing I hope you take away tonight, if there's one thing I hope you remember when you get home, it's this. Get involved. Find your passion and get involved. If it's with the Muni League, great. We'd love to have you. If it's something else, that's great too. But find some way to take your energy, take your creativity, take that big, bold idea you have in your head and dare to make it reality. Because the changes we make in our communities today can change the face of our communities tomorrow. Thank you. <clears throat> So it's now my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Joel Gruber. Joel is a relationship associate with J.P. Morgan Chase, where she's responsible for structuring grants and executing J.P. Morgan's global philanthropic strategy in a number of Western states. Prior to that, she was a research and evaluation specialist for J.P. Morgan's national team in New York. And she's worked in corporate responsibility at Dannon and at the Robin Hood Foundation. Joelle has a master's degree in public administration from Columbia University. She has a bachelor's from the University of Chicago. She serves on the board of the Municipal League Foundation, and she has the privilege of introducing our speakers tonight. So please join me in offering a warm welcome to Joelle Gruber. <clears throat> everyone. I'm not going to comment on the speed geek part of the event, just the speed part. <laughs> part of my job is enforcing that. Um, but I want to take a minute to thank everyone for coming. On behalf of the nearly 3,000 employees in Washington, it's my pleasure to speak about J.P. Morgan Chase's work in the community. We're the third largest corporate donor, and we support um, things that we believe lead to a community re revitalization, such as creating jobs, creating affordable housing, more effectively educating our students and supporting arts and culture. And we know that part of this revitalization is contingent upon an engaged civic population. And that's why we support the Municipal League. And I'm here with my colleague, Tom Perrick, who's sitting sort of in the back there, <laughs> who is the uh, government relations executive for J.P. Morgan Chase for the Pacific Northwest. And Tom does really our grassroots efforts in Washington State. So Tom and, on behalf of Tom and I, thank you so much for joining us tonight. So again, a reminder of the format, each candidate has five, or each um, speaker, possibly candidate, <laughs> uh, has five minutes and then I'll be back up here to introduce the next candidate. So I think Matt's just gonna set up the slides and then we'll get going. Thanks everyone. So our first speaker is Shala Messina. Um, she's an analytic thinker who brings a blend of financial and social expertise experience from her work as a private equity investor and as a foundation grant maker. Um, Shala completed the sustainable MBA program at the Bainbridge Graduate Institute in June of 2008 where her capstone project was on community economic development. Uh, during her degree program, she worked as a portfolio analyst intern for Good Capital where she did market research and financial analysis. Shala's also done research on small business capital for Michael Schumann. Based, be, between undergraduate and business school, she spent 10 years honing her problem analysis and business management skills at tech companies from megacorp to startup. In addition to her MBA, Shell has a bachelor's and master's degree in computer science. So you probably know how to work a computer. <laughs> so I'm just going to. All right. Okay. And 
away we go. So um, I'm Shala Messina, and I'm one of the co-founders of Hub Seattle, along with Brian Howe and Jacob Kolker. And we wouldn't be here without Lindsay Ng and Kimo Jordan. And I'm glad for a chance to tell you a little bit about the Hub. Now, the Hub was actually is actually part of a network of hubs. It was founded by a guy named Jonathan Robinson, a cultural anthropologist, and he opened the first Hub in uh, outside of London in Islington in 2004. Now, the Hub um, is uh, a group of people that were gathered together to share space in a way that's kind of part members club, part innovation agency, part think tank, and part business incubator. Now, key innovation is that instead of renting space, you buy membership time, like a cell phone plan. So, Jonathan, um, working together like this is sometimes called co-working. People are attracted to co-working because it's about building networks. Uh, people come together to reduce their isolation, build relationships, and improve their productivity. Now, I'm excited about the Hub as an economic development tool because working together this way helps people build trust with each other. A global survey measured this trust by people's willingness to walk away from their laptop when they're in a co-working space. 54% of people surveyed said always, and 29% said for several hours. Trust is key for the Hub. More than just sharing a workspace, Hubbers share values, and the values of the global Hub are trust, courage, and collaboration. This is a key differentiator between being at the Hub and being in a coffee shop. We're not just a workspace, we're a community. Since 2004, Hubs have spread all over the world. There are more than 35 now. The Hub is organized as an Austrian cooperative federation. We are organized one Hub, one vote. And Hub initiatives apply and get approved to open. Hub Berkeley was the first in North America, which opened in 2009 and quickly expanded to become Hub Bay Area. Hub LA opened September 29th, we just opened October 26th, and Hub Boulder will open on 12-12-12. So Brian got approval to become a Hub initiative over a year and a half ago in spring of 2011. In November, we opened a temporary location in the Globe Building in Pioneer Square and began to search for a permanent space and investors and build the team. I joined the team in January of 2011 and uh, we opened in 2012. Um, along the way, we've attracted some fellow travelers. The Bainbridge Graduate Institute and Social Venture Partners are also co-tenants with us in this building. And so I'm gonna give you a whirlwind tour of who's here in the hub. Now, what activates a hub? This model of running a hub was created by Hub Bay Area. So it's not just the shared workspace, but we also use the space for events like this one so that there's regular circulation of new folks and new ideas. Um, there's breakout rooms. You can kind of see some examples in the back where people can have some private meetings or deep phone calls. And then we're anchored by full-time office tenants. We have for-profit tenants. We have a consulting agency, an insurance brokerage, um, two funds that do global microfinance. Now, a consulting agency and insurance brokerage, how are those about making a better world? Well, they're actually certified B corporations. This is a voluntary certification process that a company can go through and they get evaluated in governance, workers, community, and the environment. And we're working on our B certification for the hub. We also have some nonprofit tenants. Um, Ashoka Seattle and One World Now both work with youth. Northwest Entrepreneur Network has their offices here and they put on a number of events for people trying to develop businesses and do startups. And See Your Impact is, works with nonprofits to help them communicate better with donors and supporters. So as a general member, there are four different levels that you can join at. You can join it as a Hub Connect member and just say, I want to support social enterprise in Seattle. Or you can pay more per month and have uh, more days in the space per month all the way up to using this as your full-time office. We also have an incubator designed to support people doing startups. You get seven weeks of intensive support and some funding, and then you pay that funding back out of as a paying, paying a percentage of your revenue. Um, Bainbridge Graduate Institute is on the fourth floor and on the third floor with classrooms. So their Metro Evening MBA program meets here in this building. They also have a hybrid program, which is intensive style, where it's four-day weekends once a month. That meets out in Islandwood. And then they do one-year certificate programs. Along with Bainbridge Graduate Institute, they brought the OSR Masters in Organizational Development. And then they also have a program called Start Zone, which started at Highline Community College and does business technical assistance and outreach. And then Social Venture Partners is here with us on the third floor. And Social Venture Partners works with folks um, about becoming better philanthropists and donors, and then partners with nonprofits to strengthen nonprofits and help the two engage. So I am very proud and happy to welcome you folks to the Hub Seattle, and I hope that gives you a little bit of context to your, for your visit. And uh, the Muni League is uh, joining us now as one of our members. So we'll be seeing Lauren around and hopefully seeing some of you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so 
So big shoes to fill. Next, it's my privilege to introduce Deanna Dawson. She's the executive director of the Suburban Cities Association, where she represents suburban cities in King County. Deanna has served on the Edmond City Council and also served as executive director of Sn Snohomish County, Washington, where she oversaw law and justice and human services. Deanna holds a JD from the UW School of Law. Immediately prior to joining Suburban Cities, she resided in Washington, D.C., where she served as Director of Federal Affairs and Diversity Initiatives for Justice at Stake, a national bipartisan campaign working to keep courts fair, impartial, and accountable. She has practiced law in the public and private sectors and serves on board the boards of Big Brothers Big Sisters of Snohomish County, Washington Women Lawyers, Team Child, the Snohomish County Center for Battered Women, and Sound Families. Thanks, Diana. So uh, I'm the executive director of what I like to call the uh, somewhat ironically titled Suburban Cities Association. Um, and I say that because our members don't, we have 35 member cities and they don't really consider themselves to be suburbs. Uh, with one exception, Sammamish thinks they're a suburb of Redmond. Um, <laughs> so I'll tell you a little quiz here. Um, what do Boeing, Microsoft, and one million people have in common? The answer is that they're all based in cities in King County and none of them are in Seattle. Um, one of the things that I think we need to talk about as we're talking about having bold ideas for our region in the future is really understanding what this region looks like and where the population is. Um, about 90% of King County is in cities, but about half of the county, or a little bit more than half of the county, are in cities other than Seattle. There's about 600,000 people who live in Seattle, but well over a million people live in other cities in this county. And so when we're talking about moving the region forward, it's important to have that perspective. Um, most of the population growth in this state and in this county is happening within cities, and by far the greatest increase in the diversity in this region is happening within cities other than Seattle. We're seeing it in South King County in particular, so as we're talking about moving forward, it's important to realize that. Um, the other thing that people need to realize, I think, better about when we're talking about local government in this region is how local government gets their funding. Primarily, they get their funding through sales tax and property taxes, but only a very tiny percentage of the sales taxes that go um, actually go to local government. About less than 10% go to local government, go to cities, and less than 20% of your property tax dollars are going to local government. So when we're thinking about where our tax dollars go and how we're going to fund essential services at the local level, it's really important to have a realistic view of that. And it's also important for people to realize that the Great Recession, the economic downturn that started in 2008, has had a major negative impact on local government. The way that we've been funding local government, the way that we've been funding infrastructure in particular, is not sustainable in this region. Um, in particular, one of the things I'll mention to you that in addition to the economic downturn is that gas tax revenues are shrinking in this area. We're driving more efficient cars and we're driving less. That's all good, except when it comes to funding transportation because it means we have less dollars. Citizen initiatives have also had a devastating impact on local government, and these changes really <coughs> represent the new normal. Um, you're not going to see cities coming out of this even as the economy recovers, but the economic recovery will be hampered by a lack of funding for infrastructure projects unless we start to get really serious about changing the way that we look at funding local government and funding transportation in this state. Um, we have major infrastructure needs in this uh, state and in this county in particular that have been too, too long, uh, not ignored, but uh, put off because of the fact that we have, since the early 2000s, been hit really hard by these initiatives and we've had a lack of substantial funding and we haven't had a major statewide transportation infusion in many, many years in this state. Um, we did some looking along with King County recently with all our member cities and with the city of Seattle at all the projects that we've identified as needing to be done to keep this, move, this economy moving forward and the region moving forward and we have less, far less than half of the dollars that we need to actually do these projects. And these are projects that can put people back to work, move goods and services and really jumpstart the economy. And that doesn't even include the gap that we have for transit and that transit gap is coming towards us really fast right now. Um, the impact of this is substantial on the local economy. By not funding these transportation projects and infrastructure projects, we're costing businesses in this region. And if we don't start to change that, if we don't start to make substantial investments in local infrastructure and transportation in particular, we're concerned that we're going to start to see businesses and residents look elsewhere to invest and to work. 
So that's sort of the downside. Um, the good thing that I would say to you is that we're seeing really exciting things happening at the local level. Um, because it has been more than a decade now that local governments have been hit with some of these really big challenges, they've learned to do things in more efficient ways and they've learned to work together to break down silos between communities. Um, it's amazing to see the level of bipartisan support that you have for cooperation. It's not like DC and it's not like Olympia when you look at how our local leaders are moving forward. And I would say that that's the biggest bright spot that we have in this region is the fact that we have some outstanding local leaders in our cities. Um, but the challenge that we have is we need to educate the public and that's where all of you come in as civic leaders. We need to better educate the public about those needs. Um, as I conclude, I'll just mention to you, I mentioned our organization is somewhat ironically named. We're actually meeting tomorrow night with our general membership and the board's recommending that we change our name to the Sound Cities Association because we're really not suburbs and we need to stop thinking about cities like Kirkland and Kent and Renton and Redmond as being suburbs of Seattle. They're vibrant communities and they're job centers and we need to keep uh, looking at them that way. Thanks for your time. job. So we're going to keep rolling. It's my pleasure next to introduce David Dowd. He's a community activist and a businessman. As managing broker at McConkie Development, he represents landlords, tenants, and investors. David is also active in Rotary and a board member at the Bellevue Downtown Association. A former political candidate, David started Candidate Check when he realized after the fact his political opponents had been hiding embarrassing background information from him and from Washington State voters. That experience convinced him to start Candidate Check to increase transparency in politics. Welcome, David. Thanks so much. Hi, I'm David Dowd. I'm the founder and CEO of Candidate Check. Candidate Check provides background checks for candidates running for public office. We're a little like the car facts of politics. I'd like to thank the Municipal League for inviting me to participate in this wonderful event this evening. Our bold idea is to provide information that advances trust in the political process and enables vested stakeholders to make more informed decisions. I'm a former political candidate. I ran twice for office right here in Washington State. And both times I ran against an opponent who had adverse public record information that was never properly disclosed to the voters. After those campaigns, I was driving around on a windy, rainy night like this evening I thought to myself, what are the odds of one American running for office twice and twice having the campaign hinge on background issues? I reached out to a friend of mine who runs one of the largest employment screening companies in America, right here in Bothell. And he, he told me, basically, the only job America can apply for today without doing a background check is to run for office. And candidate check was born. Background issues are, are real issues in campaigns. We see it every campaign cycle. And this election year was no different. Skeletons come out every single cycle. And the voters have a right to know, I think, up front what they want to do with that information. We saw 2012 uh, <laughs> Donald Trump uh, uh, asking questions about the nationality of our President of the United States. We had Herman Cain. We had Rob Lagojevich. We had Anthony Weiner. You probably have a favorite of your own. It was also a theme right here in Washington State. The, the, the state auditor, the race was, uh, had issues in that, that race as well. It had issues on lieutenant governor, as well as state senate races. So it's a recurring problem at all levels of government. And the problem right now is the way the system really works is when you run for office, you do opposition research on your opponent, and then you find the information out and you share it with the voters. And that creates, this opposition research creates a lot of negativity in the, in the campaign cycle, and I feel builds a lot of mistrust. What my company seeks to do, like the Carfax, is create a self-authorized product where you verify your own credentials up front for the voters, and you share it with all the constituents involved. It's a basic background check. It's criminal, civil, employment verification, education verification, military credentials. Some of my partner's top clients, talent-wise, include legal women voters, Bartel Drugs, Washington Federal. Because background checks are a national standard in any, any private sector job. It's, since 9-11, it's been a growing dramatically. We've seen uh, people want more information. They want to trust, but they really want to verify. And it's not just background checks. As we move to a more online economy, consumers want more information before they make a choice. Reputation capital is a huge and growing sector in our economy. And one company I'd like to highlight in this regard is called TaskRabbit. TaskRabbit is a company online 
where you can hire somebody to come do simple chores at your house. The question is, how do you know who to hire? Well, they have a complex and thorough vetting process, so you can make a more informed decision as a consumer on the other end of that computer. It includes a background check. It includes a thorough application, and it includes a complete interview. At the end of the day, the consumer can make a better choice with more information. And the Media League, to me, reminds me of Little TaskRabbit. You've got a fantastic questionnaire. You've got a great interview process. And you've got wonderful reference checks. But what misses is that little verification step, that independent base of information in which your consumers, the voters, can make their own judgments from. I'm really proud to say in 2012, Candidate Check worked with our new Secretary of State, Kim Wyman. Kim understands the voters' pamphlet is not a verified document. And she took the extraordinary measure of verifying her own credentials and sharing with voters. And I believe it helped her win. Here's a copy of Kim's report. Link. What's really important for you to notice on this report is there's no opinion or editorial. It's just information meant so you can make a, more, a better decision on your own. It's an idea whose time has come. Everywhere I go, we're working with some of the industry leaders nationwide, including Nation Builder. We're in conversations with some leading nonprofits. People want more information to make better decisions. It's my goal, hopefully, that one day this will be a new national standard. We will not have a double standard in America. Well, the only job you apply for does not require this type of verification. My board is completely nonpartisan. We're bipartisan, as a matter of fact. And I'd like to again conclude by thanking the Municipal League for inviting me to participate tonight. David was sharing with us that he had a pretty harsh critic when he was rehearsing, so excellent job. <laughs> um, so next we have a um, dynamic duo. We have Sarah Snyder and John Scholes. Um, Sarah works on urban design and architecture projects at LMN Architects, ranging from streetscaping work for small communities to campus master plans and to convention centers. As the lead AP, she is currently working on the Student Activities Center for UW Bothell campus, as well as the Port Angeles waterfront redesign. Sarah is also the recipient of AIA Seattle's 2012 Emerging Professionals Travel Scholarship Award for her proposal, Growing Up Downtown, Raising a Family in Urban Seattle. Sarah serves on the Seattle Planning Commission and on the Urban Land Institute Seattle Young, Leaderships Lead Young Leaders Leadership Team. Uh, John Scholes is the Vice President of Advocacy and Economic Development for the Downtown Seattle Over Association, where he oversees DSA's political advocacy business recruitment, retention, and public policy programs. Prior to joining DSA in 2008, he served as the Director of Research and a Senior Communications Aide on Governor Gregoire's successful re-election campaign. John has held positions in government, the nonprofit, and private sectors in the city of Seattle. He lives in downtown Seattle with his wife and two tw three-year-old twins. So welcome. I'm going to press the space bar when you get up here. Be a race, and really. Okay. Okay. So, uh, as she mentioned, um, I'm researching how families with children can um, live in more urban environments than is typically the norm, um, and hopefully to eventually reduce the impacts of the negative impacts of sprawl on our community. So, show of hands, who grew up in the suburbs? Cul-de-sacs, anybody? Yep. It's it's the majority for most people. You can see it on the screen. They're in the rural to suburban zone. Um, but what makes, a fam what makes a neighborhood family friendly in a city? I'm looking at five different areas of research. Housing, the cost, the size, um, the location, um, and then education, which is probably the, the first thing that came to mind when you said family, when you thought of families downtown. Um, recreation space, uh, mobility, and kind of the catch-all neighborhood uh, friendliness and amenities. So the upper left-hand corner is Battery Park in New York, teeming with children right now. The schools are overflowing. They can't figure out where to put them. Um, Boston, Charlestown, every, uh, all of these cities that I visited have kids living downtown. Um, Seattle is one of the cities that has the least number of kids downtown. Uh, Chicago, lower middle, that's where I was born, lived until I was one, and my parents moved out because the school's uh, the school issue. So quality education. Um, all of these cities have schools downtown, something that Seattle does not, right in the core. Um, but how you define downtown is also one of the key issues. Um, I'm defining it as transit-rich, walkable neighborhoods. 
Um, recreation space. Did you learn to ride your bike in uh, Central Park in New York? Probably not, but many kids do. Um, lower right, Boston, uh, Minneapolis, there's a developer who's actually advertising not only a dog run at his new multifamily development, but a children's playground. A lot of developers in New York City actually build uh, small playgrounds in their developments. Uh, recreation space for teenagers is tough, so a lot of cities build um, skate parks and the like. So mobility, bikes, buses. At what age do you think you would let your own children ride the bus by themselves here in Seattle? In Japan, it's as young as six years old, kids taking the trains by themselves to school. Uh, bikes, would you let your kids ride their bikes in the bike lanes in Seattle? What about cycle tracks and um, safer ways to bike and walk around town? Um, small note that small child in the bike in, on the bike in Boulder is probably not uh, old enough to be in that seat. Uh, the neighborhood amenities, so libraries, um, museums, closing streets down. The lower right uh, is the Children's Museum in Boston. I have a friend who lives in downtown Boston. She says she doesn't have to buy a lot of these big toys that take up space because they go to the Children's Museum every week. Um, so obviously the cost of, living and uh, cost of living can be defined as housing plus transportation. But I would argue that in cities um, and when you have kids, that cost changes to the cost of housing plus transportation plus education. Whether or not you can afford private school or um, if chances are if you're moving to a suburb for better schools, you're, that cost is incorporated into the cost of housing. So for Seattle and, and for many cities and suburban cities, um, actively involving parent groups to change the way cities function, um, building, building rec centers and amenities downtown that will uh, incorporate or that will um, encourage families with kids. And the no-brainers, um, places are better for everybody when they're great for kids. Um, so the tough questions are how to integrate housing affordability into the equation and, uh, and schools. I'm going to pick up right where Sarah left off and bring us uh, home a little bit to downtown Seattle. I think family-sized housing is a really important issue, but it's not where I think we should start. Uh, these two girls are probably going to grow out of this closet that they're living in, and it's important that we find them a two- and three-bedroom, but we've got lower-hanging fruit. One of them is quality education in a downtown environment. We don't have it right now in downtown Seattle. We need it. We have an opportunity to get it. Uh, with uh, the next school levy that's on the ballot in February. And we got to think outside of the box, get the kids out of the portables, but also think outside the box about what that school would look like. Kid-friendly recreation, another low-hanging fruit in my mind. Our public spaces in downtown right now are not great for kids. You can see the expression on this boy's face looking at Westlake Park. Pavement, benches, trees, no playground. We raised $140,000. There'll be a playground there in January. Low-hanging fruit. Transportation, I think we're doing pretty well here. Uh, and we can think of the small things as well. It's you know curb cuts and cracked sidewalks for the strollers. Uh, and, and additional rail and bus service is important too, but let's think of the small things. Again, neighborhood attractions, another th area where we're doing pretty well. Uh, one of the reasons my wife and I moved downtown, we found ourselves driving to all these things in downtown uh, to uh, spend time with our kids. We said, well, they're, they're all down there. Why don't we live down there? Uh, so we've got a lot of good things going in downtown, and real quickly, the reason this matters, I think, to other places is it's not just about downtown Seattle, but how do we uh, have other cities within the region, the suburban cities, if we want to call them that, also attractive to families uh, is key to how we're going to grow in the next 20 years. Thanks. That was a nice job sharing the podium. So next we have Greg Shaw. Greg is the, is the new publisher and CEO of CrossCut an online news publication for the Pacific Northwest. A former journalist who started his career at the Cherokee Advocate, Shaw worked as Microsoft's corporate communication manager, and most recently for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, heading the program's Pacific Northwest program as director of grantee partner engagement. Shaw is a member of Governor Gregoire's Early Learning Council, serves on the board of the YMCA of Greater Seattle, and is a senior fellow within the University of Washington's Center for Communications and Civil Engagement. He's also an avid, avid fly fisherman and part owner of Walla Walla Suites. Thanks. Okay. You ready? Yeah. Hi, I'm Greg Shaw. I'm the publisher of, of Crosscut. And my bold idea begins with a question, which is what is the public's role in supporting quality competitive journalism. And I want to invite those that might be watching or if you want to, uh, if, as you leave, uh, get on Twitter, get on Facebook and continue the, the conversation at, at Crosscut. 
Thomas Jefferson once said that if he had to choose between a government without newspapers or newspapers without government, he would choose the former. And unfortunately, we're very much at risk of the, of the, of the previous happening, and that is no newspapers. And that's largely what, uh, what the focus will be here. To understand this bold idea, I, I really begin with the premise of an independent, quality, competitive news environment is critical. Number two, that quality uh, journalism environment is very much at risk, as you will see. And the third is that online journalism, particularly accessed by a mobile device, is really the future. The U.S. Senate was so concerned about the future of journalism as a core concept in our democracy that they held a hearing uh, to really look at that. You've seen the New Orleans Times-Picayune, which really distinguished itself during the Katrina crisis, uh, no longer in print. You saw Newsweek no longer in print. And of course, here in Seattle, we're familiar that the PI is, is no longer around. Just a few weeks ago, the Cleveland Plain Dealer announced that it will go to three days a week. So over the course of the next six slides, you will see a sort of sickeningly steep decline in a lot of the statistics uh, that predict where we're headed with journalism, a decline in the number of dailies. Uh, the revenues and ads are simply no longer there to, to support. The, you know, it used to be that circulation plus advertising would support journalism. Uh, that is no longer the case. Um, and the result has been that our election coverage, uh, just one example, is very, uh, you know, is very much below uh, what, we, what our expectations should be. In the 2012, uh, this election that has just passed, much less coverage than even the previous election of, of 2008. Um, in, in Seattle, which uh, you'll see in, in just a few moments, uh, the, uh, the, the, the amount of news coverage has declined 70 percent. That's a result of the news coverage, the news staff uh, dramatically uh, declining. There is a silver lining in all of this, which is that uh, local news remains very trusted. It is, you know, within a lot of different categories, whether it's government, national news, uh, advocacy groups, Local news is, is very much trusted, uh, you know, as, as you see here. One of the things that we see is that as journalism declines, we see a lessening of, of, a, of a civil discourse. We see less voter participation. And in Cincinnati, the Cincinnati Post folded, is no longer around, and many speculate that the lower vo voter participation and the, the lower levels of civil discourse uh, in Ohio has, uh, has largely resulted from that. Uh, global spending, when we look at strong republics uh, around the world, in Western Europe, uh, public, that is public funding to support independent journalism uh, is very strong. The United States is an outlier in this, very, very low public investment in, uh, in, in journalism. And so here we are uh, in, in really you know, looking at this bold idea. Our democracy was founded on the idea that there is a strong journalism, that there's strong news reporting. The question now is how do we support that? Now, I work for a nonprofit news organization. Many are unprofitable news. We happen to actually operate as a nonprofit. Uh, we raise our revenues in the ways that you see there, wealthy individuals who believe in, in the importance of journalism, foundations, and we continue to raise money through uh, advertising and, and subscriptions. Here you see the Texas Tribune, which is a, six, a sister publication of ours. Over 50 percent of those revenues go into news and editorial. Uh, for most news, commercial uh, news organizations, that's about 10 percent, so it's very low. H here's the, the bold idea. The bold idea, which I'm not necessarily advocating for, but I want you to think about, are three possible ways of funding. A consumer voucher that every family might have $35 to spend on NPR, to spend on uh, some form of public uh, journalism, an innovation fund uh, for journalism, or putting money into uh, 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 job development and job training. There you saw some of the design principles. It would have to be independent. It would be publicly funded. And the result would be uh, uh, a plethora of, of uh, news coverage and really bringing back the tradition of, of a strong journalism in our communities. So thank you. Thanks, Greg. So next we have Maggie Walker. 
Uh, with the degrees in history and journalism from Vanderbilt, Maggie Walker worked in commercial furnishings and the design industry for 15 years. She's con continued to, as a design and art consultant, as well as becoming very active in the nonprofit community, which is an understatement. She's demonstrated an unparalleled commitment to the region's most treasured nonprofit institutions. And I don't have time to list <laughs> all the boards you serve on, so I apologize for the abbreviated list, which is not pretty long still. So uh, Maggie serves on the board of the Henry Art Gallery, the Woodland Park Zoological Society, Washington Women's Foundation, the Arcs Foundation, MOHAI, the Washington Audubon, the Seattle Children's Home, the Seattle Art Museum, the Seattle Foundation, and an advisory board for the UW College on the Environment, the Bullet Foundation, Board of Directors, the Prosperity Partnerships Cultural Task Force. In addition, <laughs> Maggie was recently reappointed co-chair of the Central Waterfront Committee and joined the Board of Global Partnerships. Maggie and Doug further um, demonstrate their commitment to the environment, education, and the arts by supporting those areas through the Walker Family Foundation at the Seattle Foundation. Thanks, Maggie. So, I don't, I'm not currently serving on all those boards. I have served on them. So, I want to ask you a question. What was the experience you had as a child that sparked you, that made you really excited about what you wanted to be when you grew up? And I'm going to show you a series of pictures of kids of all ages having cultural experiences in our city, in our region, that have sparked them. And you can see it in their eyes. You can see it in what they're responding to. We've spent enormous amounts of money in this community building our cultural infrastructure over the last 15 years. And yet we have not um, kept public funding of access to those cultural institutions at anywhere near the level it was in the 1970s. Because of that, fewer and fewer children have these experiences. They don't have these experiences in school um, field trips. They don't have that, those experiences with their parents who can't afford necessarily to buy entrance to these cultural institutions. Given that that was our view of the situation and given that this region has enormous cultural resources at this point which are attractive to corporations, to locate here and attract great employees to live here, we decided, um, John Shirley and I were co-chairs of a, a fund, uh, excuse me, of a, an attempt to bring public funding back into this sphere through implementation of what's called the Denver Plan. And it would require a very small increment of property or sales tax to be dedicated to access for these cultural institutions. We have been trying for four years to get legislation through the state legislature to allow counties either alone or in aggregation to ask the voters if they would be willing to support such an activity. And we have so far not had success but are continuing our diligent tenacity. So I will tell you that this model is very simple. It creates a larger fund through this increment of sales or property tax which would be distributed by an existing county bureaucracy. The large organizations would be given a, a, a guaranteed increment and it would be based on their attendance on their budget size. The small organizations, which are very small community-based organizations, would get grants out of this pool of money. It would act as an enormous um, safety net, particularly for the issue of access for school children and for those who cannot necessarily afford to get access to these incredible resources. The education, as has been described to you, the educational resources attract people to cities, not just the schools, but all the other experiences that are available to us and to our children. And those things need to be supported with public funding. Right now, there is next to none in our cultural infrastructure. And I don't think that most people realize that that's the case. So our job as the Cultural Access Fund group is to organize and unite the cultural institutions, which has happened, and we are lobbying actively in Olympia to have this legislation passed, and then we would come to the voters of what we would hope would be a, an aggregate of the Puget Sound counties to pass this very small increment of sales tax. It would make an incredible difference in the lives of our children and the lives, frankly, of folks who don't have access to this kind of excellence. So we have made it um, a commitment uh, at the large organizations have particularly led in this effort. And um, I urge you, if you know your state legislature, call them up and say you support the Cultural Access Fund legislation and you'd like to see it passed. Um, I have had several meetings with Frank Chop. This summer he contacted me and he said he was interested in getting this through. So we're waiting to see and we look forward to have 
Every child in our region have at least one, if not two, extraordinary experiences in cultural institutions over the next years. Um, we are deeply committed to it. it. It makes a difference. It brings the spark to their eyes, and it makes their education meaningful to them. They see what it really means in their lives. So thank you, and um, I'm happy to talk to anyone who's interested in being of help to it. But I think it's a bold idea. It's worked tremendously in Denver. Denver has renewed it three times over the last 20 years. And each time, the voters have increased the approval rating. So it is a fabulous model, and we look forward to implementing it soon. Thank you. Still had another minute. <laughs> um, a minute to reflect. Um, so while the slides are finishing up, I can introduce Carrie Bozeman. Uh, Carrie is an esteemed former elected official and dedicated public servant. He, serves as, he served as the mayor of Bremerton for two terms and is well known for initiating a bold redevelopment plan that dramatically improved the waterfront area now known as the Harborside District. Carrie has also served on Bellevue City Council and served three terms as mayor of Bellevue. His achievements in Bellevue earned him numerous honors, including recognition by the Municipal League as an outstanding public official in King County in 1993. Most recently, Carrie served as the CEO of the Port of Bremerton. Bozeman has also held executive positions with the Olympic College Foundation and the Boys and Girls Club. He now brings his leadership talents to support communities and companies as principal consultant with NextGen today. Thanks. My bold idea is given a speech in five minutes. <laughs> uh, my bold idea is urban spaces. I'm a big believer that cities are made up of great spaces. So this is a story of an urban space that was built on two and a half acres in a little poor city called Bremerton, Washington. Our, it was a waterfront project. Most of our waterfront was taken up by automobiles and by parking lots and were owned by people who had no interest in redevelopment. We were able to acquire about two acres on the waterfront in downtown Bremerton for about $4 million. We put a plan together that called for parks, hotels, restaurants, condominiums, marinas, and we had no money, uh, retail shops, an auto tunnel, fountains, a plaza. And we got all that done in less than five years with no public money from the city going into it. We had a couple of problems that we wanted to do. We, this is a, the downtown, and we're right next to one of the biggest manufacturing locations in the state the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard. So we needed to buffer the downtown and we needed to uh, build a new marina so we could have more access as a boating community. And this was what we visualized as the future was gonna be. We had wanted people living down there so we had to build condominiums, we had to build public spaces, we had to build fountains, and we put a plan together. And this was our plan. It showed exactly what we were going to do. It showed when we were going to do it, how we were going to do it, who was going to pay for it, and when it was going to get done. And it showed the creation of a, a, bu a buffer space between the downtown and the park. This was our first project. It was a public-private project. The city built actually the parking garage. Opus Development built a hotel and built the, uh, an office building and built a conference center with the PFD. This was a $68 million project. So we built a nice conference center, housed about 750 people, which has been profitable for the last five years. We went worked with Wet Design to develop this wonderful fountain, series of fountains in the park. Uh, kids play around them. They're, they're, they go by music. They have music to them. But we wanted to also get the cars off of the downtown, off of the Harborside District. So we designed a tunnel to take the ferry traffic from our Harborside District out of the city. So we got this tunnel done. Frank Chop helped us develop. We had $56 million, we got it built. We wanted to build a new marina, so we worked with the Port of Bremerton. That's a breakwater that, uh, that you see there. There's a $36 million project that we got done by the Port of Bremerton, 360 slips. We, we really believed for this space to work, we had to have people living downtown. So we worked with the, with the County Housing Authority, who worked as our developer on these two projects. Now we have three condominiums right downtown. There had never been a condominium. But the big part was we wanted to be a people place with great plazas. So as you can see in our plazas, there's wonderful furniture, there's great spaces, there's fountains throughout, 
we maintain it. We have the best flower boxes in the state, and it's starting to attract development. But this was our big project. This was the buffer between the shipyard and the little harborside district that we wanted to create. So we designed a buffer. We designed a museum about the shipyard there. We moved in a 50, 100-year-old building there, and we designed. This was the space we started out with. This was a dirty space, environmentally didn't work. We had to have the Navy clean it up. We got the federal government to actually give it to us, uh, which was no easy task, but with the help of Norm Dix, we were able to get that acquired. It's a small space, it was like 150 feet wide, and this was the beginning of, uh, we developed this ourselves. All these trees you see here were bought throughout the Northwest. They're all mature, they're all beautiful trees. We wanted the park to look uh, ready to go when we opened it. This is a series of fountains that Wet Design out of Los Angeles did for us. We wanted it to look like ships coming out of the shipyard. We wanted to have the history of the shipyard be a part of this space. And so you see the fountains operating. And this was space right next to the, uh, this is all in two and a half acres, right next to the ferry terminal. The sculpture in all this project is a local sculptor that has now worked all over the world on projects similar to this. But this is a space where we have wine festivals and a variety of other things. This is our fountain park, we call it, right next to the ferry terminal. It's lit at night, and in the summer, all these little ponds that you see, kids play in these ponds, and if the weather's over 75 degrees, these ponds are full of families and kids going down to the fountain park. This was our last project that we had a vision for on the waterfront that we didn't get done. It was a promenade that would run and connect the downtown uh, Harborside District to six neighborhoods in the city. We were not able to get that permitted. I still believe it should be done. Uh, and this was our vision for the future. This was the creation of the Harborside District, which would create a, a waterfront city with a wonderful plaza and a great urban space that would continue to attract development for the future. And that's our bold idea. Excellent, it's beautiful. Uh, so next, we're just moving right along, we have Brian Bennett. Brian was born in Burien, and his family in Burien goes back four generations. Uh, he now lives in northern Burien with his wife and their two daughters. He works as a business and technology attorney for F F5 Networks, a Seattle-based global technology company. He has a bachelor's degree in comparative literature from the University of Washington and a JD from New York University School of Law, where he served as online editor of the Environmental Law Journal and president of the Student Animal League Defense Fund. Brian was first elected to the council in November 2009. He has previously served as deputy mayor. Prior to his election to the city council, he served on the Burien Planning Commission and as chair of the Burien Shoreline Advisory Committee. Please help me welcome Brian. So um, I apologize, I didn't have a chance to put together any slides tonight. Um, wonderful slides, though, that everyone else was able to put together, so I appreciated those. So um, I, I, I work in both the private sector and in government at the same time. Um, my real job, I'm a lawyer at F5 Networks, a technology company based here in Seattle, and my part-time job, I'm the mayor of Burien. And there are a couple of themes that I hear a lot about that kind of intersect in the two areas that I work that I think it's important that we accurately consider. And one of those is the, the free market and to the degree to which it is a solution for the problems that government faces. Um, F5 Networks were, is a very successful technology company and it's an example of an area where the free market works very well. We have competitors that come and go on an annual basis. It's a very fast paced competitive industry and, and it's, so like I said, it's an example of, of where the free market works well. One of the things that I have to deal with on a regular basis is the regulations we face as a country, especially around the world. And I think it's important that when we allow the free market to work that we be careful about how we regulate it. One of the problems we face globally is that regulations are often used as a means for corruption and bribery and a, as a public American company, we, we can't really pay those bribes, and so it makes it difficult for us to work around the world. That being said, one of the things I hear a lot about is that the free market is a solution to all of the problems or the issues that government faces. And I think it's important that we accurately 
assess the, deg the degree to which the free market is a solution. One example that's important nationally and it's also imp very important to my community is healthcare. And I hear on a regular basis from people that really struggle with paying for health care and how, how to provide health care for their families. In Burien and South King County, we have a very high percentage of uninsured. And it's, it's an incredibly difficult issue for people on a daily basis. And I think it's one of the, the driving issues that we faced in the foreclosure crisis is bankruptcies that were caused by people lacking health care. And so I think one of the things that's important to acknowledge is that healthcare is an example of the free market failing to address the, the issues that government faces. There are tens of millions of people in America that lack insurance and lack access to healthcare because the free market has failed in this area. And so I think it's just an example of an issue that we need to carefully consider as we move forward, both regionally and nationally to what degree the free market will work. I think education is another issue that we're going to face here locally. It's not one that we have faced in my community yet with regard to charter schools, but it's, a, it's an important issue that we're going to have to face. One other theme that I've heard a lot about that I just want to touch on briefly is this idea of makers and takers. I, I heard about it just recently quite a bit with the election and the election results. And it concerns me I think the implication is that the, the takers are supposed to be people that just want government handouts. And the implication is that roughly 50% of our country are takers. And you know, my personal experience on a practical level in my community is that we have families that uh, a large number of working families who work for very low wages in service industry jobs. And these are families that the parents often work multiple jobs in each family so the kids are basically on their own. And it's very important that we consider those individuals. I think it's the most important thing that we should consider is the effect on those families and what we can do to help them. And I think it's important not only for those families themselves, but it's important for our society at large because in the end, at some point we're all gonna be in this together. And one of the things I've noticed is that especially living in countries with very large disparities of wealth. Um, a couple examples, I, I lived in Russia and South Africa. It's no, ma no matter how much, how many resources are put into personal security, no one, no, no matter how wealthy you are, you, you're, you're never safe in those countries. And I think it's something that we really want to consider. What is, what kind of safety net we want to have in place for our community as a whole and the, the benefits that that will provide for our community. So anyway, those are just a couple issues that um, I've been thinking about recently. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys about them. Thanks, Brian, I bet it's harder to do it without slides, so nice job. <laughs> Um, so last but certainly not least, we have Chris Rogers. Uh, Chris is the CEO and a founding partner of Point32, a Seattle-based real estate development company that is working to transform Seattle's built environment through strong partnerships, quality design and construction, and a commitment to environmental performance. Uh, projects include the award-winning Art Stable, uh, the Bullet Center, and McGilvra Place Park, the Bellroy Apartments on Capitol Hill, and the Bethaday Community Learning Space for the Technology Access Foundation. Chris was formerly the Director of Capital Projects and Government Affairs at the Seattle Art Museum, where he oversaw the development of the Olympic Sculpture Park. Previously, he created and protected urban peaks and landscapes from Alaska to Puerto Rico for the Trust for Public Land, including the creation of a 14-mile stream valley park through the city of Baltimore. Chris has served on numerous nonprofit boards and is currently a member of the Seattle Parks Foundation's Advisory Council and Arcade the Pacific Northwest Design Journal. In 2010, he received an honor award from the Seattle AIA, and in 2007, he was named Seattle Magazine's Person of the Year. A Seattle native, Chris has an undergraduate degree in art history from Bowdoin College and a master's in forestry from Yale University. Please welcome Chris, thanks. Thank you very much. So uh, the bold idea I wanna talk about is uh, a building that is uh, under construction on Capitol Hill right now called the Bullet Center that is being spearheaded uh, by the Bullet Foundation. It is a six-story commercial building that is pursuing a new standard 
um, in environmental uh, green building called the Living Building Challenge that was authored uh, here in Seattle. Um, it's a standard that focuses on performance, so essentially setting up uh, the opportunity to live within your ecological means. So in addition to meeting net zero energy and water, we're also looking at how to eliminate known toxics and hazards from the building process, uh, avoiding the red list. Um, so uh, when we started uh, this aspect, we came across um, terrifying uh, reports like this one that showed us that killer whales have the highest concentration of halogenated flame retardants of any mammal on Earth. Um, obviously, should be a concern to us uh, here in Puget Sound. We also are learning about the impacts that things like vinyl flooring are having on our children. So really thinking about when we build buildings, what's going in them and understanding the impacts they're uh, having on those occupants. Um, when we look at um, what is allowed currently under HUD, um, even though we know that 0.1 parts per million of formaldehyde causes adverse health impacts, we're actually allowed to build buildings and use materials that exceed that, um, which is clearly uh, not the right thing to do. So the Living Building Challenge gave us an initial list of, I believe, uh, 13 known hazards that we had to look for in sourcing all of our, of our materials, and we thought that would be relatively easy. And it was when we were identifying things like formaldehyde that are noted on a material um, safety data sheet that accompanies um, every product that we were um, buying. But it turns out that there were lots of other things uh, in those products that were either uh, misspelled or hard to pronounce, such as this word here, and I won't even try. So what we ended up doing is uh, looking at each of those materials and identifying them through their CAS number, which is uh, akin to a social security number, and set up a database that essentially um, we use to search all of the products that um, our subconsultants, subcontractors, were actually um, suggesting that we would use. And so through that CAS number, we were able to learn exactly what um, those products contained. And it turns out that that list of 13 became 362 chemicals that we had to avoid. So in the process of about 18 months, we vetted over 1,100 products um, and have created a database that will now be shared with the building industry. Locally, uh, the folks at the International Living Futures Institute will put it out on something called Declare uh, that is very similar to an ingredients label for food products that we're all becoming much more accustomed to and, and interested in, in tracking. Just one example, um, uh, this process also allowed us to work with manufacturers. Once we realized what was in their products, we were able to say to them, hey, this is a a serious hazard, and in the case of Prosoco, which is this liquid applied air barrier you can see in orange there on the building surface, um, they actually reformulated their product to remove uh, the known phthalate in that material that is a known carcinogen. So we're using this process to really transform the building industry. Um, in other cases, uh, it's you know making good choices, what is um, accessible to us locally, um, that can be brought to the site and reduce the environmental impact of transport. We're also able to sort of keep track on how those uh, building products are manufactured. So the whole objective behind this aspect of the building and the overall project is to really change uh, the nature of the green building industry, to look at how a building performs um, in the long term and to use this process to educate future buildings that will follow us. So. We've already created um, quite a stir. We've gotten a lot of attention. We've had folks like Lisa Jackson from the EPA visiting the project, presidents from around the world wanting to adopt um, what it is that we've learned here in Seattle uh, that they can apply to uh, their projects. So the building will open in early 2013, and we invite you to uh, come see it. Thank you. So that's our program for tonight. Please join me one more time in thanking all of our speakers. Thank you to everyone again for coming. Uh, safe travels home. Good night. <laughs>